Hello there. In this video, we're going to explore centrifugal and Coriolis forces by analyzing some footage recorded by the slow-mo guys. In this footage, they're recording a laser disc which is being spun at such a high RPM that it shatters. And they're recording these shattering fragments at 80,000 frames per second. And what makes this footage so wonderful is they effectively have taken it in two different frames of reference. So the first frame of reference here is an inertial frame, which is just watching the disc spin. And so what I'm doing here with these red dots is I'm tracking the center of mass of one of the shattering fragments. And look, we can see that the center of mass of this fragment is just traveling with a constant velocity. And so it has a linear trajectory. Which makes sense, because aside from gravity, which is negligible at the speeds that we're dealing with, there aren't any net external forces on the fragment after it's separated from the disc. But then the slow-mo guys repeat the footage, and this time the camera frame locks to the rotation of the disc. And now, if I track the same fragment, we can see that its trajectory in this new frame is some kind of characteristic spirally curve. In this video, we're going to learn about centrifugal and Coriolis forces in order to determine exactly what this curve is. So in the first clip, we were effectively in an inertial frame of reference. We were watching the disc rotate in the counterclockwise direction. I'm going to go ahead and call this frame I for inertial. As for our axes, we're going to go ahead and define the plane that our disc fragments are in as the XY plane, and our Z axis is going to come out of the page pointing towards us. However, in the second clip, we've now locked onto that counterclockwise rotation. Our frame is now rotating uniformly with some constant angular velocity omega. And if we want to write this angular velocity as a vector, remember the right hand rule, this omega vector is going to point in the positive z hat direction. Let's call this rotating frame of reference n for non-inertial frame of reference. So the first thing I want to make super clear is that because we know that n is rotating with respect to i, I could take the linear motion of the fragment in the i frame and then transform it with a rotation matrix to determine the fragment's motion in the n frame. However, and this is the key point, what if I want to do all of my physics in the n frame directly, right? Because a lot of the time in physics, it's actually really inconvenient to try and figure out what your motion looks like from an inertial frame's point of view. So let's try that for this fragment. Let's try analyzing its motion in the n frame directly. So if we want to do that, if we want to analyze the fragment's motion in our rotating frame directly, we're going to have to modify Newton's second law. We're going to have to add in fictitious forces. So consider a fragment in the n frame. We're going to point to it with a position vector r, and at any point it could have some velocity which I'll call r dot. And even though we know that there aren't any real forces acting on this disk fragment here, aside from gravity which is negligible, I'm going to have to add in two fictitious forces, the centrifugal force and the Coriolis force. We have to introduce these fictitious forces because I'm working in a uniformly rotating frame of reference. So in blue here, I'm going to write out the general form of the centrifugal force, and in purple, the Coriolis force. Using the right hand rule, I'm able to write out in this picture the exact directions of my centrifugal and Coriolis forces. Alright, but now let's use the formulas here to come up with exact expressions for the centrifugal and Coriolis forces on my fragment. So remember, my fragment is in the xy plane, so r is going to be equal to xx hat plus yy hat in Cartesian coordinates. And its velocity at any given time we can write out as x dot x hat plus y dot y hat. And as a reminder, this omega parameter is going to be capital omega in the z hat direction, and of course, m would refer to the mass of our fragment. Let's start by getting our centrifugal force, which we can mostly intuit. I'm not going to go through and waste time calculating two cross products when we can clearly see that the centrifugal force is going to be pointing in the same direction as r. So by looking at the picture here, we know that our centrifugal force is going to be equal to m omega squared times r, or xx hat plus yy hat. 
And then maybe because we're not totally sure about the direction of our Coriolis force here, let's go ahead and do the cross product directly. So if I do the cross product directly for my Coriolis force, for that omega parameter, I'm gonna plug in omega in the z hat, and then I'm going to cross it with x dot x hat plus y dot y hat, right? And then the main thing that we're gonna to have to remember is how to cross product unit vectors. So by definitions of cross products, z hat cross x hat is going to give us y hat, and z hat cross y hat is going to give us minus x hat. Right, so again, to re-emphasize the two kind of strategies that we have here for coming up with the centrifugal or the Coriolis forces, we can either calculate our cross products directly, or we can use a little bit of intuition to speed things up. All right, but now we have these two fictitious forces. All right, so then from here, everything's more or less going to play out, just like Newton's second law. We're going to take these fictitious forces now, and we know there aren't any other forces on the disk, so it's just the fictitious forces, and we're going to set that equal to ma, which in Cartesian coordinates is going to look like x double dot x hat plus y double dot y hat. And then from here to get our equations of motion, I'm going to go ahead and underline for us all of the x hat terms in green and all of the y hat terms in blue. And what we're going to want to do, right, because these directions are independent of each other, is we're going to pull out the green and we're going to get an equation for x and we're going to pull out the blue and we're going to get an equation for y, right? And once we've done that, what I want us to appreciate is that we have a system of coupled differential equations here, right? You can see that we have this mixing of x and y terms in our two equations. So in this video, I'm not going to go through methods on solving these systems of coupled differential equations, that warrants its own video. But instead, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to jump straight to the solution of this system. All right, and I'm also going to provide a solution for a very simple set of initial conditions. So one particularly nice solution here would be x of t is equal to vt cosine omega t and y of t is equal to minus vt sine omega t. Okay, and I wrote the initial conditions this corresponds to in the parentheses below. The fragment starts at an origin with some velocity v purely in the x direction. Right, so even though I'm not going through the methods to actually solve this differential equation, Equation, I want us to get out a much more general skill out of this video too, which is how to verify a solution to a differential equation or a set of differential equations, right? And in order to verify our solution, what we can do is simply plug in our solutions for x everywhere there's an x and our solutions for y everywhere there's a y. So because we have two equations here, we'd have to verify both of them, right? But I'm only going to go ahead and walk through verifying the green equation here, right? And so what I'm going to do is everywhere I see an x, I'm going to plug in vt cos omega t, and everywhere I see a y, I'm going to plug in minus vt sine omega t, right? And when we plug in, we're going to have to compute some of these time derivatives along the way. And then once we've done that, we can appreciate that the left-hand side and the right-hand side of our equation are identical. If you don't see it immediately, I'm going to highlight some of those terms that match up across the equation in yellow, and then I'm going to match up some terms in green that match up across the equation. All right, so we've gone through and verified that our solution here satisfies the top equation in green, and we could do the exact same thing for the bottom equation in blue. All right, and now I want us to appreciate the solution that we've stumbled across here. What we have is the parametric form for an Archimedean spiral. So this is the mystery shape that our little shard here is actually tracing. You know, and I just went ahead and plugged in simple numbers for v and omega, right? And we could run through the numbers using the specific values of the slow-mo guys video. I'm not going to do that. I just want us to appreciate the shape of the motion that we're actually getting here. All right, and the last thing I want us to appreciate here is that if we zoom in, we're getting this clockwise deflection of our shard, right? And if you remember, when we locked in to that disc, that spinning disc, it was rotating in the counterclockwise direction, right? So when we go through and lock into that counterclockwise rotation, we're going to naturally see a clockwise deflection of our disc fragment, right? So picture that in your mind and hopefully that intuitively makes sense. But anyways, I'm going to go ahead and end this video here. If you enjoyed this video, let me know in the comments and consider subscribing to the channel. I love to hear about people getting on board. But other than that, thank you so, so much for watching.